Come on, come on, somebody. You can be seated in the house today. How awesome is that, y'all? Yeah, yeah, we are so excited, guys, and capital campaign and building plans and all that will come uh, in the months um, leading up and after our uh, advanced series. But we just were, again, just blown away at God's faithfulness um, and, and what he's, when he calls us to do stuff, he's so faithful um, to provide. Amen? Amen. Amen. Y'all, y'all been enjoying the sweet summer series? I've had so much fun, y'all. I've had so much fun. We got to talk about sweet freedom, and we had them red, white, and blue bomb pops. Come on, somebody! And then, and then we we talked. What was our next week? We talked uh, week two, week three yesterday. Transformation. We talked about IC. We talked about the the things God has done uh, at the hill and the hill Bolivar. Come on, somebody! And and like Fable talked, and she convicted me all over again about just remembering what God has done. And then yesterday, uh, Pastor, not yesterday, last Sunday. Pastor Clinton talked uh, about sweet transformation, and we gave out cotton candy. Come on, somebody. That was good stuff. Amen. Uh, Today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and we're in the uh, Sweet Summer series. Don't get ahead of me, Kylie. We're going to show them that in a little bit. You didn't see it, okay? No, no, no. Don't show it yet. Don't show it yet. We're going to show it in a little bit. Uh, We're in the Sweet Summer series, Matthew chapter 5, 1 through 13. Here's what it says, verse 1. Seeing the crowd, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened up uh, his mouth and he taught them saying, I love, it says he opened up his mouth and taught him because see what you put in comes out. Okay, two of y'all get that. Come on, somebody. See, what you put in, the Bible says that it's like a wellspring comes flowing out, right? It's not what goes in the body that defiles the body, but what comes out. And when he opened his mouth, life came out. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, uh, mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they, for they shall inherit the uh, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for right standing with God or righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they're gonna see God. Come on, somebody. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. Right? Blessed are the people when they're made fun of and laughed at and scoffed at for standing for truth. For theirs is the king's dominion of heaven in, I, in, this, in this world. Come on, somebody. Verse 12, uh, sorry, 11. When, Blessed are you when others rival you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. I always tell people uh, in the church world, if you haven't been called a cult at least once, you ain't doing nothing. Come on, somebody. Amen, 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 amen. Come on now. Uh, come on, somebody. Verse 12 says, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For, they, for so they persecuted the prophets who before you. We'll come to 13 in a little bit. But I love, I love when Jesus gets up to teach because he starts talking like on this weird concept of when you're sad, you're, you're blessed. And when you're broke, you're blessed. Come on, somebody. And when things are going bad, you're blessed. And when your world could be falling apart, Come on, somebody, you're blessed. And when you're angry, you should still be blessed. And, and he's got this, he's talking in this concept. He says, I need us to understand that, that you are not like, you are not bound to, the, to your predicament. You are not bound by your current uh, uh, situation, right? Jesus is like, don't allow your current predicament to cause you to not see life in its fullness. He's saying, quit looking at life in this limited perspective, right? Because life in its fullness is life with the view of eternity. Come on, somebody, right? Just to say, listen, when you view life, rejoice, right? Your work, what you're working for is not temporal, although there's temporal blessings. What you're working for is an eternal thing. Right, Jesus, he's talking to these guys. and He's like, listen, you're going to go through some stuff and, and you're going to face some stuff, but don't let it speak to your identity. Right, he's saying, listen, you are, you're not blessed because of what you're going through. You're blessed for where you're going. Come on, somebody, right? You're blessed because you're, you're headed to heaven. You're headed for an eternity with my father. He says, listen, we're not looking for man's applause, but we're looking for God's approval. That's what he's saying. Right, we're not looking for likes and loves, right? We're looking for the leading of the Holy Ghost in our daily life, but it's so counterculture, right? Because when you're, when you're taking a picture, uh, I got my phone somewhere. When you're taking a picture, you got to make sure the lighting's right. Come on, somebody. 
You gotta make sure you got the right angle. I gotta, one of my teeth is discolored, so I'm always like trying to make sure I don't show my dark tooth. Come on, somebody, right? Like, like we all got these little issues that we see in ourselves that we try to hide when it comes to people seeing us, right? He's like, listen, that stuff doesn't define you, right? He's saying, you're not blessed because of what you're going through. You're blessed because of where you're going. He says, matter of fact, I need you to rejoice. What's rejoice mean? Rejoy. Do it again. Praise again, not because you feel it, not because things are all perfect, but rejoy or praise God or, or be, be blessed because you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. It literally dwells inside of you. You are built different. Come on, somebody. I love what Harry S. Truman said. He said, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. What's the mission of the hill? Anybody know? Say it all the time. Make Jesus famous. I love it when the crowd knows it. Come on, somebody. It's to make Jesus famous because really we're not worried about the hill getting the credit. We're worried about people's lives being changed, right? We're built different. He says rejoice. Be blessed, right? And, and we've confused um, what it means to be blessed with what it means to be rich. I got three people amen in me. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Amen. If we're all in that place, then we're paying off the land today. Come on. Just as like you're blessed because I'm going to reward you, it just may look different than you originally thought. Amen? But then he transitions in verse 13. Let's read this. He says, in verse 13, he says, look, you're the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, it can't be salty again. That's a fair, that's a fair statement. Right? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by, under people's feet. See, they, and that was something they would do when salt, they didn't have like uh, a refined salt or processed salt like we use, right? They had salt flats and they'd mine it and they'd, it, was, it was in the rough. And sometimes when it wasn't salty or didn't have the characteristics of, of whole salt or lost that, they would literally scatter on the roads or on rooftops or around ovens and it would become hard. And it would literally become like walkways for people, uh, um, for people to walk on, right? That's literally what would happen. And Jesus is saying, you are the salt. And I read that and I think to myself, what a weird thing for Jesus to tell us. Anybody? And then I think to myself, how on earth does that pertain to sweet summer? Now you can show my title. Come on, somebody. Today we're talking sweet and salty. Amen? Amen. We're talking... We, 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 our gift today is saltwater taffy. Come on, so we'll give you some saltwater taffy after service. Uh, be sweet and, and salty. Jesus is looking at the disciples and he says, listen, he transitions from all this blessed talk, right, to this conversation of how you've got to be salt into the world around you. And the reality is salt is essential for our daily life. There was a salt famine during Europe's dark ages due to glacial melting and ocean levels rose and flooding. They flooded all the salt flats of Europe causing a salt famine. And there's a study done by Henry uh, Perenne. The daily average of salt ration fell to less than two grams per person and it caused many to die from dehydration. Isn't that funny? No salt. They died of lack of water. Water all around them and they died of lack of water. And check this out. Madness. People literally died from going crazy. Come on, somebody. You feel like you're taking crazy pills. To get salt, check this out. To get salt, some of the stronger uh, people, they would assault the weaker people. This is the, this is the truth. They would cut their throat, their jugular vein, and they would literally drink the blood of the victim for the salt that was in the blood. That's disgusting. Guess what? It's in part what gave birth to the myth of the vampire. Isn't that wild? Absolutely wild. See, salt is essential. Salt enhances, salt preserves, salt purifies, salt heals. Salt within our nutrition, it brings energy. It helps regulate blood pressure. Uh, it helps with nerve function and muscle function. Uh, it actually helps the thyroid. If you're having thyroid issues, could be the amount of salt you're taking in. It keeps you hydrated and can help improve symptoms of cystic fibrosis, uh, cystic fibrosis. Also, it helps with brain function. Literally, check this out. I knew this. I knew all the years people told me I should not put salt on my ketchup before I dip my fries. Come on, somebody. I knew. I knew I was right. And I knew that it was keeping me from going crazy. Come on, somebody. Y'all looking at me like that's too much salt, Pastor. Mind your business. Come on now. Amen. Get behind me, Satan. I'm going to eat all the salt I want. I don't come to me after service and say, you know, pastor, really too much salt can be bad. Keep it to yourself. 
I like salt. Amen? Amen. Salt is essential. Look at your neighbor. Say, you're essential. See, the reality is Jesus is looking at the disciples and, and the people. And he goes, listen, salt is essential uh, for daily life. And he's telling them, you are essential for the world around you. Matter of fact, salt makes everything better. <laughs> Glory to God. Come on, somebody. Right? You ever had food that didn't put any salt on it? Oh, Jesus. You eat it and smile and just can't wait to leave. So you Salt makes everything better, right? And here's the reality. He's saying you're the salt, and if salt makes everything better, you should too. Come on now, right? He's saying, listen, disciples, everywhere you go, uh, you shouldn't walk into the room full of gossip, and gossip still be going on. You should make the room better. You shouldn't walk into a room where people are all depressed, hating on everything, and, and join into their depressed, hating on gossip and talking, right? You should make the room just a little bit better, man. You should be a thermostat, not a thermometer. You shouldn't walk in the room and go, oh, everybody's sat in here. You ought to walk in the room since that the temperature's off. Come on, somebody, and start infusing some joy to that thing. Start infusing some hope into that thing, some life into that thing, some peace. In I'm getting sweaty too early in this message. Come on, somebody. You're a thermostat. Amen. Salt changes everything it encounters. I was, uh, when I would work in sales and when I was in college, I had this funny story, I was working in sales, a uh, full-time volunteer in ministry, and uh, I was also going to college full-time. Um, it was crazy time, but anyhow, my, one of my professors, we were walking, um, and uh, one of the kids in the class, and my professor was, was using some specific language that, that no one should say, but I can't repeat in church, come on, and uh, he was dropping F-bombs, and, and the other student, she goes, quit talking like that around this guy. And I was like, well, don't offend me. I, you, I don't expect people to have a filter that I have if they don't have that filter. I'm expecting them to change who they are for who I am. Only the Holy Ghost can change who they are. Come on now. Anyhow, I asked, they, she said, quit talking like that around him, man. And I said, hey, it doesn't offend me. She goes, I know it don't offend you, but it makes me feel weird. Come on, somebody. See, we're the salt. Everywhere we should go, it should change the atmosphere. It should change the room. And really, everything salt encounters, it changes. The first thing we see that we're going to talk about the salt does, salt enhances flavor. You are, better said, you should be an enhancer everywhere you go. Jesus enhanced everything he touched. Like, I picture it being hot in the desert. Yo, who's been to the desert before? Like, the real desert, not like, like, I'm talking the real desert. It's hot. I was in India, um, and, and uh, I've been to the Persian Gulf and all that, but I was in India, and it was 122 degrees and humid. Oh, yeah. You, you, would, you would wake up, take a shower, you look out the window and start smelling bad. It's miserable. Miserable, right? It was absolutely miserable. I imagine Jesus, and it could have been right before this setting of Scripture. Everyone's hot, and when you're hot, you're cranky. Am I the only person that gets Hanky? I don't know if that's not the word we want to use. Hey, I get, get hot and, 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 and angry. Anyhow, uh, cranky. And, and so, gee, I don't know if the disciples were in this place, but I imagine that it was like some point, it's hot, they're miserable, they're complaining, they're tired. They're like, Jesus, we're so tired of dealing with everybody's problems. It's not just you that struggle with that. Come on now. We're tired of everybody complaining. We're tired. They all say you preach too long. Come on, somebody. They all say they wish we'd play a different song. I like this song better, and I'm not going to lift my hand and I'm gonna, I, we're so tired of all this mess, right? They're, they're dealing with people, right? And I imagine Jesus going, shh. And he turns around behind a rock and he picks up these cups. First of all, they're like, what is this? It's a paper cup. Come on. Somebody. And he goes, I call it a slushy. <laughs> Don't tell nobody. It won't be invented for a long time, but it'll shut you up. Come on, somebody. Because <laughs> Jesus enhanced everywhere he went. Jesus walked into a room with a demon-possessed guy, and the demon had to flee. Jesus walked into a room with a dead girl, and the dead girl came back to life. Jesus walked into the room with a crippled guy, and the crippled guy began to walk. Come on now. Jesus walked into the room with people full of depression, and depression had to go. See, the reality was Jesus understood as the, as the salt, he changed everything or everyone everywhere he went. So when he walked into the room, he influenced the demon. The demon didn't influence him. He influenced depression. Depression didn't influence him. Come on, somebody. See, we've got people in our world that drive us nuts. You got that person. 
And like, like you just can't stand them and they make you mad. Y'all got them. What am I going to say? And if not, you're that person to somebody, right? We all got them in our life. And in and, and the process of, of living life, in the process of going through all this stuff, we got those people, they walk in and we're like, oh God, Lord, help me not to, help me not to hit them right in the mouth because they need it. Help me, Jesus. Help me. And God's going, like you're saying, deliver me, oh God. And he's going, no, I'm not going to deliver you. You are there to deliver them. That's what enhancers do. They don't want to get out. They say, Lord, help me to, be, help me to influence that person. Help me to influence that, that person that drives me nuts, right? John 10.10 10 says that we should have a life and life abundantly. I had this guy uh, in the Stockton church. Really, if you were looking at him, you'd say he has everything he could ever want. Uh, got a great family, got a thriving business. Um, he, he's just killing it in life, right? He, I knew him growing up, and we weren't, uh, he showed up to church one day, one Wednesday night, and I was talking on praise, and he came to the front and gave his life to Jesus. It was amazing, right? Never, never been, wasn't really a church guy growing up. I, I don't know if he's even ever been, really. And he started coming to church and, 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 and surrendering his life to Christ, and he called me one night. He said, bro, this Christian stuff is amazing, I said, I know what I've been telling you. He goes, no, I ain't even kidding. He said, everything's better as a Christian. I said, I know. He goes, I'm not kidding. The food tastes better. I said, I know. He said, I swear my wife, she'll better cook now. <laughs> he's like, he's going on. My work is better. My employees are better. Even the people that call me with problems are better since I've been a Christian. He said, I ain't even kidding, Pastor Bo. And there was this pause. And he goes, even sex is better as a Christian. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Someone's really uncomfortable right now. Amen. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Not me, right? Come on, somebody, because I'm thankful. <laughs> See, Jesus enhances everything in your life. Jesus should enhance everyone's life around you when you're there. Amen? Here's the reality. You're the salt. You are the salt. If you feel like people are walking on you, guess what? It's time to get salty. Amen? The second thing that I, was, that I read when I was studying this that I learned uh, salt does, it preserves, right? Preserve means to keep from harm or loss. They would put salt, and still do to this day, uh, they put salt on meat um, to keep it from decaying too quickly. Without refrigeration, they put salt on it, and it keeps it, uh, it keeps it, it keeps it good to eat, right? And I couldn't help but think about Lot and his wife. If you don't know this story, it's in the book of Genesis. Lot and his wife, and it's such a cool story, right? Because Lot and Abraham, they have the they have the same call essentially, and they're looking over this land, and and, and Abraham's like, well, "What land do you want?" And Lot uh, said, "Well, I'll take the land of Sodom and Gomorrah." And I understand all the, like the, the natural principles there that he saw that it was fruitful um, and he picked it for himself, which, listen, if someone says, listen, I'm going to give you a choice between two cars. One is a, a, a 2021 mid-engine Corvette and the other is a 1972 Chevy Love. Rust it out. What do you want? No one's going to blame you for picking the Corvette. Come on, somebody. Even if you don't like it, sell it, right? Nobody's going to blame you. So I don't blame Lot for picking Sodom and Gomorrah. Matter of fact, I believe that Lot, because he was under Abraham's covering, had the same call that Abraham had, which was to bring the king's dominion, the kingdom of God, everywhere he went. I believe that when Lot showed up in Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot's heart was to influence the leaders of Sodom and Gomorrah, to influence the town and the culture of Sodom and Gomorrah. I firmly believe that Lot was created and placed on the planet for when a moment he came to, when he got the choice to pick between Zor or whatever it was, or Ai and Sodom and Gomorrah, and he picked Sodom and Gomorrah, it would be to change the culture of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because if he picked the other, Abraham would have changed Sodom and Gomorrah. Just like Jonah and Nineveh, God had a plan to redeem, or can I say it like this, to preserve Sodom. And Gomorrah. And I think for a while they did it. I think for a while they were praying for the sick and they were telling people, listen guys, sexual perversion is a bad thing. For a while they were saying, man, murder is not okay. You shouldn't be murdering people, right? And you shouldn't be thieving and all this stuff. But at some point, what we do know is at some point they quit being the salt. And at some point, I think they said, the fight is just too much. You ever been there? 
where the fight is so brutal, you're like, I'm just so tired of fighting. You ever allowed something or made a decision that you knew wasn't correct, but you did it just because you didn't want to have to deal with the fight that would come after? Okay, there's four of us. Hope that the rest of you never have to. And then this angel shows up and he says, hey, uh, I'm going to destroy this place. Right, and Abraham, we know the story, Abraham intercedes, and, and they, but it doesn't work, and the angel shows up, and he meets Lot, and he says, I'm destroying this place, and they come into Lot's house, and the people of the city are banging against Lot's doors, trying to rape these two guests that they didn't know were angels. And the angels look at Lot and his wife, and they say, get your daughters, get your son-in-laws, we're leaving, I'm destroying the place. And that setting of scripture says, and Lot lingered. We know that Lot, we feel like Lot had a heart's desire to pursue the things of God. Why would he linger in a city filled with sin? I can't help but think for a moment his heart paused and he thought, what if I would have done things different? I can't, I don't know, but I can't help but believe for a moment he knew he was called to influence Sodom and Gomorrah. But at this point, Sodom and Gomorrah had influenced him. So they run, right? They run. And uh, as they're running away, the angels tell them before they run, they're like, don't even look back at the destruction. It's, it's bad. Run. So they're running and, 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 and the, the, the city's being destroyed. And as they're running, Lot's wife, she just can't help it. She has to, her heart, a piece of her heart was still there. I think she was called to be an intercession for the city. And, and, and she didn't do it right. And she's running away. And a part of her was stuck in Sodom and Gomorrah. And as they're running away, she stops and she turns. And the Bible says in that moment, she turned into a pillar of salt. You know what the last thing Lot said to his wife was? Honey, I think someone's following us. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. (laughs) It's my corny joke, I love it. (laughs) I just pictured her running. Someone's following, and she's like, what? And then froze, you know. (laughs) Real talk, real talk. She turned into a pillar of salt. You ever wonder why salt? I think it was a prophetic declaration of what she was called to be in Sodom and Gomorrah. But as she lost her saltiness, she was literally tossed on the side of the road to be trampled on everyone that passed by. Whoa. See, salt purifies, right? Salt preserves. Salt, their heart, I think their call was to preserve the culture of Sodom and Gomorrah. It just didn't happen. Next, we see salt purifies. Purify literally means to remove contaminants from. Guys, we are called to be culture purifiers. But the problem is we live in this bully culture. We live in this bully culture. See, the way it used to be was if I disagreed with you about something, we would have a conversation and we could leave. Tolerance means I don't have to agree with you, but I don't hate you if you believe different. I'm a Chiefs fan. Are there any Bronco or Raider fans in the house? Way too many. Way too many. Who you like? Even worse, Broncos, the Raiders scare me a little bit. Anyhow, the Broncos, let's say that we were having a conversation and I'm like explaining why the Chiefs are better because they're God's team. Anyhow, and you were telling me why the Broncos are better. We used to would have said like we do, we made some jokes and we'd have walked away. But in the culture we live, within the last 10 years since I've been a pastor, I've watched this cultural shift go from no longer can we not disagree agreeably, right? We went from saying tolerance is we can disagree and not hate each other, but we've started to say tolerance is only when you agree with what I believe. But more tragic in the last probably two years, we've gone from you agree with what I believe to you embrace what I believe. What's the difference? We used to be able to say the Chiefs are better. The Chiefs are better. I don't care about John Elway. It's Patrick Mahomes. Come on. We used to would have agreed. But, but, but there's this shift that happened that, that he would have said, 
No, you need to think the Broncos are the best team in the NFL ever. To now, he's saying, he would say, not only do you need to think they're the best, but you need to wear a Broncos jersey, hat, and buy season tickets. See, our culture has said, not only do you have to believe what I believe, you have to embrace what I believe, and I want you to pay for what I believe. It's this bully culture that we live in, this bully society where we can't just disagree and, and still get along, right? We live in this bully culture that says, you have to do what I say. King Josiah lived in a similar culture. He became king like at eight years old, right? And, and they had other gods and they, had, they were doing all this sin stuff, right? And as they were living life, I need a Bible. As they were living life, there was this, I need a Bible, quickly. As they were living life, bring it up here. Come on, Adam. I left mine in my bag and I'm using my bag. As they were living life, someone brought him the Bible or the word that they had. And they said, King Josiah, we found this word and in this, this letter that, that Moses wrote, we see, it's funny because this fell open to the Jerusalem and the temple and all that stuff. And, and they said, as we, as we read, we see right here where it says you should have no other gods. That you shouldn't sleep around. You shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. And, and you shouldn't do this. And you shouldn't covet. And Josiah heard the word. The Bible says he tore his clothing. Because see, the word purified the sin of the culture that he was living in. See, the word, it's not easy, but it purifies sin. It purifies culture. Josiah, this young king, goes against what he was taught by his family. I'm going to preach it. Goes against what he was taught by culture. And he says, I don't care how you feel. Facts don't have feelings. Truth doesn't have feelings. The word of God says we should have no other gods, King Josiah said. And he tore his clothes and he said, we're getting right with God's word from this point on. That's what purification does. That's what purification does. I couldn't help but think about Jesus and the disciples. Now he called a fisherman that had anger issues, probably had some addiction issues, kind of a jealous guy, kind of really pretty much just cared about himself. And in the process of that, Jesus purified him. And Pastor Clinton said it last week, he went from being Simon to Petra. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. Jesus spoke truth and it changed the culture within him. Guys, we are called to be purifiers of the word of God. Come on, somebody. Fourth, salt heals. Now, I asked some a doctor friend in the first service, I said, when they come to the ER, let's say someone cut their arm with a chainsaw, do you just pour salt in it? <laughs> Obviously the answer is no. So you're safe to go to the ER. But it's interesting, if, if you were somewhere out and you had a wound, salt will actually keep it from, it'll begin to heal the wound from the inside out. The problem is salt burns before it heals. Can I tell you, God's word often burns before it heals. It's like, I'll be reading this thing, I'll be reading it, and it'll say something that goes against what I feel. And I'm like, oh, that hurt. But then I realize, it's to make me better. It's to make me whole. It burns before it heals, right? Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword cutting between the soul and the spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And Isaiah chapter 61, 1 through 5, I'm not going to read it, but, but it's about Jesus. And Jesus uh, says this in Luke chapter 4, I believe it is. And, and he says this simple thought. He says that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted. Bind up the brokenhearted literally means to bandage hurting people. You were put in this earth today for a reason. That's to heal broken people around you. See, we're a sum total of our life experiences. We're a sum total of our broken pasts, right? And then we act out 
because of our past, I couldn't help but think about Acts chapter 2. What would cause, think about this, Acts chapter 2, what would cause someone, so we have this guy that, that had been, had been, his life had been enhanced by Jesus Christ and, and his life had been preserved by Jesus and his life had been purified by Jesus and in this moment his life had been healed and, and, and they're in this upper room for like 120 days and they're beginning to pray in new tongues and the, the 3,000 people gather around them and they're like, these folks are crazy, man, they speak in all these other languages. What would cause someone except the Spirit of God dwell inside of them? The Bible says in Acts 2 that Peter stepped up. And as he stepped up, he begins to tell him, you crucified the Son of God. And he rose again in three days for the forgiveness of sins so that you can have life and life eternal. And guess what the crowd did in this moment? They said, we hate you. Get off the stage. No. No. Here's what they said. It says they were cut to the core. They said, we've never heard anything like this. It burns. But we feel like it can heal. And they asked this question, what must I do to be saved? Repent, every one of you. Quit living the way you're living. Repent means to turn around, start following Jesus. Quit following your will, start following his and be baptized, baptizo, marinated in the nature and character of Jesus Christ. So what's my point? My point is if you're broken, if you're sick, if you're aching, if you're depressed, if you're going through some stuff, be healed. My point is if you're gonna live around broken people, heal them. If you're going to deal with people with broken relationships, bring healing to them. If you're going to deal with people that are struggling with depression, heal them. You're the salt. Go and be salty. Jesus is saying you're the salt of the earth. But we're talking sweet and salty. Key to that is be sweet. Do it in the love of Christ Jesus. Amen. Do it in the love Jesus Christ don't be an angry idiot when you're telling them come on somebody do it in the love and character and nature of Jesus Christ did I tell you guys a story about that salt famine did I tell you that story did I tell you all that I, well in the in, during the Europe's dark ages did I tell you about that the study by, by uh, uh, um, 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 Henry Panay during the dark ages, the glacial melting, did I tell you story? And the, the water rose, y'all, y'all heard this before? And the waters flooded the salt mines, and then there was no salt, and they began to not know what to do with no salt, and the daily, have you guys heard this? The daily average fell to like two grams per person, can you imagine that? Have you guys heard this? It's amazing. And, and, and whenever, these, whenever the ration fell to two grams per person, did I tell you this already? There were people that died of dehydration. And there were people that died from literally going crazy. Have y'all heard this before? And then some of them were so nuts, the stronger ones would attack the weaker ones and cut their jugular vein and suck the blood out of them for the salt, giving rise to the, the myth of the vampire. Have I told you that? Y'all, have we talked about that yet? It's crazy, right? It's interesting that they lacked salt and they began to lose their mind. It's crazy that there was water all around them, but because there was no salt, they didn't have living water. Come on, somebody. It's crazy they bullied people, assaulted people, took advantage of people. They died from growing crazy. They went into a complete moral decay within their civilization because of the lack of salt. I'm here to tell somebody that our culture is struggling and people are losing their minds, bullying people, assaulting each other take advantage of weaker ones losing gender identity sexual perversion selfishness killing weaker ones because they're concerned about their own future we're talking abortion come on somebody our culture is in decay 
because the lack of salt. Decay because the salt of the earth, the salt of America, the salt of Missouri, the salt of Bolivar, the salt of your workplace, the salt of your family has quit being salty. Come on, somebody. And then we're mad when the government walks on the, I'm going to freak out, y'all. We're mad whenever people start mouthing the church, making fun of us. We're mad when they pass laws and decrees that go against what we believe. We're mad when the world walks on us. Why? That's what you do with salt that is no longer salty. It's time. It's time, y'all. We rise. It's time we step up and be the salt of the earth to a broken world. It's time that we be enhancers to the world around us, preservers to the world around us, purifiers to the world around us, and healers to the world around us. We're the salt. And we are essential. for those around us to live. There's a better way to say that. We are essential. You are essential for those around you to have life and life abundantly. You're the salt. You're the salt. It's time, y'all, that we understand that as the salt, we change the world everywhere we go. It's no longer time to shy away. It's time to boldly stand and proclaim that we're the salt of the earth. Would you bow your heads all over the place? It's time for us to go and be salty. Adam, come get your Bible, brother. Stretch your hands toward Adam, y'all. Hold this. I'm going to pray over you right here. Father, I thank you for Adam. Lord, I thank you for the call that you've placed in his heart to be a proclaimer of the gospel. When I begin to read, when I begin to open your Bible, brother, I just felt the Spirit of God begin to speak to my heart and saying that he's put a fire in you uh, to be a preacher of the gospel, to be a proclaimer of the word of God. And, and you've got some issues and some struggle in, in your past and your life. And you've listened to this. You've discredited yourself. And I need you understanding this, brother. By discrediting yourself, you're discrediting the sacrifice that he paid for you to walk in the fullness of what he's called you to do. So no longer are we going to have excuses saying, I can't because no, you're the salt. Come on, no longer are we going to say, no, I missed my moment. No, you're the salt, brother. No, yeah, that's right. Even in the midst of making bad decisions as a young boy, your heart was right, man. Your heart was to help people. Even in brokenness, your heart, you cared for the weaker ones. You cared for the ones that no one cared about. And that was a heart that God put in your life all along. The passion that he put in your, in your life from a long time ago and he says in this moment I'm bringing it all together so you understand the call on your life is not something that you dreamed up and you desired but the call on your life is something I placed in you and I the word the word of the Lord says to you I will bring the call to fruition in your life thank you Jesus I pray for each and every person in here that we would be the salt of the earth we'd be the salt to the broken people in our world that we have God we'd be the, the salt God to the, to, the, to the cashier at Walmart even if we're in self checkout come on somebody God we'd be the salt to the people at the drive through to the nurse to the doctor God I pray we'd be the salt to those that disagree politically with us we'd be the salt to people that disagree theologically with us we'd be the salt to the people that disagree with sport teams with us God, I 
I pray we would be the salt to a broken, lost, and dying world so that they can not look at us, but the word says so they can glorify our Father in heaven for our good works. And as we live our life as the salt, doing good all, and healing all that were oppressed, God, they would not look at us, but they would look at you and they would see you and their heart would be open to change and you would move in their life. And because of it, families would change. Because of it, God, uh, neighborhoods would change. Because of it, God, the city would change. God, because of it, the, the county and the region. God, the state, I pray in this house, God, you'd raise up business owners, God, and, and coaches and, and, and teachers, God, and doctors and lawyers. And, and, and God, you'd raise up politicians, God, so that we could go into our world, changing it, God, from the inside out, God, enhancing it, preserving it, purifying it, and healing it, Father God, so that we could advance your kingdom so that we can make your name famous in all our world. We thank you for it, God. Go ahead one more time. One more time. Let's sing. You 